Well, good morning. I know. Sorry, I, I That's not your. You don't need. It's a good. We got them. We got them. I wonder if these mics are actually on. Um, well, good morning. Good morning. We are here today for an important and exciting announcement. Today, we're announcing new steps that put us in the strongest possible position to win federal funding that will help advance the goals that we want for Massachusetts. You can see represented in this room the teamwork that we're truly bringing together here. And I appreciate everyone who is here and everyone who has helped make this possible. I first want to begin uh, on behalf of the Lieutenant Governor and myself by acknowledging Quentin Palfrey, who is our director for our Federal Funds and Infrastructure Office. This is a new office and a new position that we created when we started this administration because we know how important it is as a state to be there hustling, competing for every single last federal dollar available. And uh, I'm grateful to Quentin and the entire Federal Funds and Infrastructure Office team. Thank you for the work that you do. We're also joined by members of our cabinet because this is an all of government effort, um, including our Secretary of Administration and Finance, Matt Gorkowitz. Appreciate all the work that you and your team, many represented here today, thank you, uh, do. Our Secretary of Housing and Livable Communities, Ed Augustus, hot off his housing bond bill roadshow yesterday. Uh, so he gets to not speak. Uh, <laughs> our Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Rebecca Tepper. Jonathan Schrag, who is our Deputy Chief of Climate Innovation and Resilience. We also have representatives from our congressional delegation, including the offices of Senator Warren and Congress members Lynch and Presley. We also have with us today partners from the business community, from academia and policy, uh, from nonprofits, and importantly, so many of our friends in labor. Because at the end of the day, this is about money coming in putting people to work, great jobs, great opportunities uh, that run the gamut, gamut from entrepreneurship and work in labs, you know, all the way out to um, uh, building all the infrastructure necessary for this work. So we really appreciate it. We also want to give a special acknowledgement to Treasurer Deb Goldberg, who wanted to be here this morning but could not be. Um, and I want to give special acknowledgement to Treasurer Goldberg because her office worked very closely with our team on a critical portion of today's announcement. As you know, the Biden-Harris administration is making unprecedented investments. Investments in infrastructure, clean energy, climate resilience, advanced manufacturing, medical innovation, and more. These investments are aligned with our vision for Massachusetts. We are a state that leads the world, that leads the world forward and has the opportunity to do so in new and different ways while strengthening our neighborhoods and communities as we go and creating opportunity for all. So from day one of this administration, we were really clear that we had a priority to compete for federal funds, to be able to bring in federal funds, to leverage those funds with state dollars, with private investment, to get the job done. And this has paid off already. And I want folks to know that in just the short time since we created this office, we've already yielded results. Just recently, a $108 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation to support rail infrastructure in central and western Massachusetts, which will help further the West East Rail Project. Second, we want a competition to be an investor catalyst hub for ARPA-H. This is the National Institute of Health's Medical Innovation Program for Transforming Healthcare. We won that too. We also won recently a competition hosted by the Department of Defense where we received recognition as the Northeast Microelectronics Hub. That's a $20 million first year investment of CHIPS Act funding with a potential of $100 million over five years. This will create jobs, workforce training, and investment in advanced manufacturing. In addition, we put in strong applications for big projects, including nearly $1.5 billion for Cape Cod Bridges, another $700 million for the Austin Multimodal uh, Transportation product, Project. And today, we're announcing that we've applied for $250 million in clean energy investments for up to nearly 80,000 homes. This is an application to EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, the largest emission reduction initiative in U.S. history. 
So we are out there, we are after it in all sorts of ways. We've proven that we can win if we play and compete. And we've shown our commitment to turning these investments into good jobs and careers with high labor standards and equity and opportunity for our communities. But there's a lot more to do. It's estimated that there's $17.5 billion still out there in available federal funding, and the combined applications require as much as $3 billion in state matching funds to be eligible to get that money. Already, we have over $2 billion in matching funds for that purpose, and today we're filing legislation to make sure we leave nothing on the field. This legislation would make sure that when federal applications call for state matching funds, we have access to all the resources that we need to compete. Our bill will create a capital investment and debt reduction fund by leveraging interest earned by the Commonwealth Stabilization Fund. This is a pay-go fund, meaning it's capital in hand and not borrowed. Over the next three years, the fund will unlock an estimated $750 million in resources to pursue federal funding opportunities. It will also include $50 million in municipal matching grants and local infrastructure banks. This is a resource that our cities and towns can use to finance infrastructure projects that we know are so needed, and we want to help and be there for our cities and towns. We'd also set aside another $12 million for local government technical assistance in that work. It's one thing to have the money. It's another thing to go through the process of submitting an application. And we want to make sure that our municipalities are poised to be able to do that and get those applications in. Not every state has the fiscal health and the resources to do this. This capital investment and debt reduction fund will give Massachusetts a competitive edge in pursuing this historic federal funding grant opportunities. And after we get through the push for federal funding, the remaining funds will be available to invest in state assets, taking pressure off traditional capital programs and our debt portfolio. Look, this is smart, it's fiscally responsible, it's what we need to do. The second step we're taking is, I'll be signing some executive orders here in just a moment. These orders do a few things. One, we formally establish the Federal Funds and Infrastructure Office that we set up months ago. We wanted to paper it, but we also wanted to get busy and get after it uh, while we did that. So we're going to formally uh, do that today. And congratulations, Quentin, to you and the team. Quentin's going to share more about his work in a minute. And I want to take the opportunity to celebrate our Federal Funds Partnership for Municipalities and Tribes. This is about making sure that our cities, our towns, our tribes, our regional planning groups are all uh, aware of and poised to take advantage of these federal funding opportunities. Our priorities, as we have said from the outset, and that has run the gamut from the budget that we filed and ultimately signed the uh, tax cut package just a couple weeks ago, the Affordable Homes Act, which is the housing bond bill yesterday, to today. Our goal has been, as a team, to make this state more affordable, more competitive, and more equitable. Today's announcement does just that. And it's why today we're doubling down on our commitment to federal funds. We want Massachusetts to win and win big. And we want Massachusetts to be positioned as a leader as we look to lengthen our lead in areas, including critical sectors of what really is a global economy. Again, I want to thank everyone for their partnership as we rally Team Massachusetts once more and invite to the podium our Secretary of Administration and Finance, Matt Gorkowitz, who has done a tremendous job uh, throughout uh, the last nine months in helping us navigate the budget process to the tax uh, cuts recently and so much more. So Secretary Gorkowitz, thank you. Thank you, Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, for your leadership on this issue. Uh, it's been clear from day one of this administration that going after and being competitive for federal infrastructure dollars has been a top priority, and today's announcement is a big step forward in fulfilling that goal. Also, a big thank you uh, to Treasurer Goldberg and her team who have worked closely with us on the development of this legislation. Uh, the entire administration shares the Governor's sense of urgency, and I want to thank my colleagues in the Cabinet uh, who have been working uh, with us to secure unprecedented levels of federal funding uh, currently available to Massachusetts. 
I also want to thank Quentin Palfrey and his team for their partnership in this important effort and look forward to working with all of you going forward. With over $17 billion in federal funds out there for us to compete for and win, we have to be aggressive. We know other states are as well. Alongside the work Quinton is doing to coordinate across the administration and with our partners in municipal government, this legislation will help separate Massachusetts from the rest of the nation by putting substantial, dedicated resources on the table. It will also send a clear message to Washington that we are serious and ready to move on these projects. This legislation we are filing today will leverage interest on the state's stabilization fund to establish a permanent pay-as-you-go capital fund. The capital investment and debt reduction fund would create a flexible pool of $800 million in resources available over the next three years to expand the state's capacity to allocate matching funds to satisfy the requirements of many of the federal grants and provide uh, funding for the program's uh, cost. This is in addition to nearly $2 billion of matching funds we have previously identified through existing state resources, primarily through formula funds. In total, that's nearly $3 billion of matching funds available to secure investments in the future of the Commonwealth. This funding will make our application strong and competitive. We also dedicate $50 million of this new funding to ensure the competitiveness of local and regional partners through municipal matching grants and through a local infrastructure bank. The fund also includes $12 million for local government technical assistance to help municipalities successfully apply for federal opportunities. And once the opportunities presented in the IIJA, the IRA, and the IRA and the Chips and Science Act are gone after 2026, this ongoing fund will provide capital to support a significant backlog of deferred maintenance on our state assets. This will enable the administration to advance critical projects and priorities that have been authorized and supported by the legislature, but have not been funded due to constraints in our traditional uh, uh, debt financed capital program. The idea of a capital fund like this is not unique among states in the country. Many have them. In fact, it's not even unique among Ma in Massachusetts. In the past, Massachusetts has had a pay-go capital fund. It is a way not to reduce the state's reliance on long-term uh, debt and save money on projects, but can also help accelerate projects and investments to avoid construction costs and, and high interest, uh, particularly in inflationary environments. We also want to be clear about one thing. We are not proposing to touch the balance of the stabilization fund. We are only spending from the interest generated on a go-forward basis. And it should, it should it start raining, uh, we have put safeguards in this bill to ensure that the program, um, the use of the program will uh, be suspended until uh, we start building up that rainy day fund again. In this current environment and with a balance of the fund at an all-time high of $8 billion, we have a unique opportunity to use the interest generated from the fund to create something that will last longer than the federal grant opportunities, a legacy program, if you will, that will continue to pay dividends for years to come. Thank you for your leadership and your support on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor Healy. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll. Thank you, Secretary Gorkowitz. I'm so honored by the faith that you've placed in us. Um, this is an extraordinary moment in American history. It's an unprecedented opportunity for Massachusetts to make transformational change. Under the Biden administration, the federal government has made more than a trillion dollars available through the bipartisan infrastructure law, through the Inflation Reduction Act, and through the Chips and Science law. Collectively, these laws reflect a massive federal financial investment in infrastructure, technology, economic development, clean energy, decarbonization, and resiliency. And when Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll came into office, they assembled an impressive cabinet and announced a bold agenda. And from day one, Governor Healy has said that Team Massachusetts is not just going to compete for these federal funds. We're here to win. And today we're laying out the blueprint for how Massachusetts is going to establish the best effort in the nation to seize this tremendous opportunity. At the center of that plan is people. Today's executive order creates a new Office of Federal Funding and Infrastructure within the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. And I want to thank Secretary Gorkowitz and his team for your leadership and your support. And I also want to introduce our terrific team. Roger, Ben, Michaela, Christina, Sydney, Sam, Mahar. I'm so honored to be working alongside you on this important work. This team works with every cabinet agency through an advisory council on federal funds and infrastructure. 
This is a whole of government effort to identify and pursue federal funding opportunities and to put together the best possible applications. Today's executive order also creates a new clearinghouse that will help us to be systematic and strategic and thoughtful in our pursuit of these federal funds. I want to give a particular thank, uh, shout out to Climate Chief Melissa Hoffer and to Jonathan Schrag, who's here today. Uh, they're close partners in seeking federal funding relating to climate, energy, and resiliency. I also want to give a special thank you to Will Rasky, who's not with us here today, who's our federal affairs director and a key partner as we work with the Biden administration, with the federal delegation. And I want to give a, th a thank you to my wife, Anna, who is an original member of, uh, of Team Healy um, and has been so supportive supportive here. But Team Massachusetts includes so much more than state government, which is why it's so exciting that Lieutenant Governor uh, Driscoll last week uh, helped launch the Massachusetts Federal Funding Partnership. This new effort will work with the MMA, with regional planning agencies, and cities, towns, and tri tribes to collaborate on key federal funding opportunities. We want to give them the tools that they need uh, to succeed in this fight for federal funds. As Secretary Gorkowitz mentioned, our budget experts estimate that there's 17.5 billion potentially available to Massachusetts in connection with these federal funding opportunities. So today's legislation will give us the tools that we need to compete and win. The legislation gives us the resources to offer robust matching funds to make our applications competitive. It gives us technical support uh, to cities, towns, and tribes to apply for these grants and implement these important programs. And it'll put us in a position to launch a new infrastructure bank to offer new lending resources to make these projects a reality. As, Gov as Governor Healy said, Team Massachusetts is seizing this moment on federal funding. We're already seeing the results with West East Rail, with ARPA-H, with Chips and Science, with Urban Forestry, with the new Holyoke Veterans Home, and we're taking big swings. In the last couple of months, we've applied for more than $3 trillion, $3 billion, sorry, in, <laughs> in federal grants uh, relating to the Cape Cod Bridges, the I-90 Project in Alston, Solar for All, and other key priorities. Every step of the way, we're going to put our values at the center of what we do. We're going to proactively center climate, environmental justice, equity, labor and workforce. It's so great to look around the room and see so many of our partners in, in, in organized labor. That's such a key part of what we're doing here. And thank you to Secretary Jones for her leadership there. But we're just getting started. This executive order and legislation are the roadmap for how Team Massachusetts is going to be a national leader in the effort to leverage federal funds to tackle the critical agenda of the Healy Driscoll administration. And I'm so honored to be a part of that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to, to both of you, and again, thank you to all who've joined. We see partners uh, from all over, including our good friends at the uh, Mass Building Trades, Boston Build Building Trades, Greater Boston Labor Council, AFL-CIO, among others. Um, uh, because also, you know, this is, when we talk about economic growth and development, we talk about ways to, to fund, to invest in the kind of programming that we need to meet the moment we're in, in terms of dealing with real needs around resilience and climate. Uh, fixing infrastructure that has long needed attention in TLC. Um, we talk about so many different ways we can put to use this money on transportation, uh, housing, and the like. It's also important to note the jobs engine that this is and the opportunity for career development, um, which is so, so important across the state. So I appreciate everyone being here. And now we're going to go make it Let's official. Do it. Let's do it.
picture. Take any questions on topic to start? Yeah, like a ton. Like, a, I mean, you know, as you can see from the breadth of what we've already competed for and won, and what uh, we've already submitted applications for, you can see it's it's really broad, um, which is important because you know the great thing about Massachusetts, we've got so much human talent and capital here. We've got great companies here. We've got great initiatives here. We've great local leaders as well. And so that's why we want to be able to take advantage of everything that is out there. But I'll let our director speak more to that. Thanks for, for, so much for the question. It's, a, it's an all of government strategy and we're really working with every cabinet sec secretariat to identify the opportunities that are locked by these laws. And so you've seen recently how aggressive we've been, been with Cape Cod Bridges, with I-90 in Alston. Today we're announcing a $250 million uh, series of applications for solar for all under the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. But it really spans chips and science, uh, cybersecurity, internet for all, water and sewer, We've got a really broad agenda here, and we're trying to support um, all of the ambitious things that the cabinet are doing. Thank you. Is there any concern about taking the money off of the rainy day fund, just given, you know, if it's not growing anymore, um, I guess, is, there, is this part of the competition? Is there any sort of mechanism to, you know, reverse this if we come up across hard times? I'm going to let Secretary Gorko speak to that. I just want to remind folks that even this year, we continued to grow the Rainy Day Fund, okay? So that's important. Rainy Day Fund, I think, is at an all-time high, but Secretary Gorkowitz. Yeah, no, thank you for your question. Um, the Rainy Day Fund is at an all-time high. We're probably one of the top three states with the highest uh, stabilization fund balance at $8 billion. Um, we have put safeguards in the bill, meaning that if there is an event of an economic downturn and we have to draw on the fund, then the PAYGO capital program would be sp suspended temporarily until the fund is start to be, until uh, we can start to build the fund back up. Um, there are some thresholds and some safe, uh, again, guardrails in the legislation uh, that spell out how that would happen. Um, I would say that, you know, generating, uh, using the, the interest uh, prospectively, so we're not tapping the corpus of the stabilization fund, we're not touching its balance, we're in fact just um, using the interest of the um, uh, stabilization fund on a go-forward basis. So we think it's very responsible, we think it's a wise investment of those uh, dollars, um, and the PAYGO capital fund will be sized based on the interest. Uh, if Depending on interest rates and the size of the, the fund, the PAYGO program will be uh, will, will ebb and flow based on, on those resources, but we think it's a, a really smart investment, particularly given the good fortune we have with the stabilization fund balance that's almost the third highest in the country. So, what is the status of the, mm -hmm. the right uh, so we made uh, applications under the bipartisan infrastructure law um, for the first phase of our program under the mega and infra program uh, a couple of months ago and we're pursuing that application with the federal government. Um, we're about to submit a separate application under the bridge investment program which will be the second part of uh, this year's bipartisan infrastructure law applications for discretionary grant programs um, in connection with that that proposal. Um, so we're uh, we're working aggressively on those those efforts, um, and then we'll we'll develop uh, you know uh, other phases of the plan as we go forward. Is there any kind of ballpark or when that construction might begin? 
in terms in, in, well so yeah, yeah. So, so, so first we have to get through the discretionary grant program, um, and uh, we're, we're working hard on those applications, but we won't um, have answers from the USDOT for, for a few months on that. Um, the MassDOT can, can get you a production uh, schedule. There's work underway already um, in connection with that program, but we can get back to you with details on the schedule and timing. Well, the economic, it would be, it's a, it's a fairly simple construct um, at a design. One is that if there is a uh, drawer on the fund where the balance is sort of declining year over year, then that would be one of the triggers. And the other is that we cap at the threshold at about 10% of the total, uh, the total uh, operating budget, um, operating budget currently being around 50. $56 billion, so, you know, the math on that would be in any given year, it would obviously change, but um, there's there's two thresholds, so declining balance and uh, dropping below 10% of the total uh, total operating budget, and we think those are um, guardrails that are both fiscally responsible and um, support our needs in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, while not jeopardizing the Commonwealth's fiscal health in terms of its ability to weather a, a rainy day. If I might just add, um, the circumstances under which we would actually spend uh, money in connection with this would be circumstances where we were awarded a grant um, that was corresponding with that. So this is a very fiscally responsible mechanism in the sense that what we're doing is using this um, to make our applications more competitive, but we actually spend the money when we're leveraging that money to get federal funds. So for example, uh, when Secretary Howe and her team uh, helped uh, develop the application for the Chips and Science uh, award that just came through. Uh, we made a state matching commitment uh, that we think was instrumental uh, in leading to that great result. We want to be in a position every time a state government agency, a municipality, or a tribe uh, is pursuing a federal grant uh, that's going to advance our agenda and, and, and where those federal funds are going to be helpful for our overall financial health, that we can promise that money, um, but then we will only spend it when we're leveraging uh, that money to, uh, to, to join with the federal dollar. So it's, it's, it's very much about leveraging a, sm a smaller amount of state money um, to combine that with a large amount of federal money. It's a really good example. Do you all know about that? Because we've got a lot of coverage for ARPA-H and um, West East Rail. But this microelectronics hub, it's a big deal. Do you want to just just quickly give the background on that? Absolutely. The, the federal government is making an unprecedented investment in the semiconductor industry um, around both the national defense and the economic competitiveness aspects of the semiconductor industry. And under Secretary Howe's leadership, uh, the Healy Driscoll administration has been really aggressive in pursuing um, these funds to make Massachusetts a hub uh, for uh, the next wave of uh, research and development and manufacturing of semiconductors. The first phase of that uh, strategy related to the defense capabilities. And last uh, month, the Department of Defense designated Massachusetts as one of the key hubs uh, for this program. So we got that $20 million, uh, which is uh, very, uh, very helpful in moving this program forward. But more importantly, the designation as a hub is going to be the basis that we're going to be able to build on to lengthen our, our lead in semiconductor manufacturing and research and, and development here in Massachusetts. Thank you. Sure. Can you explain what this means for the average middle income family in Massachusetts? It's going to mean, I mean, if passed, and this is why we were hot after it yesterday and we're making the case everywhere we go. Fundamentally, we need more housing in the state. I don't care who you talk to. You may be a parent with kids who've come back from school or, uh, you know, early 20s who are living at home. I mean, that is such a familiar story, right? Because young people can't afford a down payment on a home, can't afford rent right now. We have seniors who are facing rent increases unprecedented around the state. We have families who are really struggling with, you know, basic affordability. We've got you know, seniors who can't afford to downsize, right? So for the average family in Massachusetts, you know, we want people to know that this law, this bill, okay, we want it to become law, we want this, this authorization, is for you. We need more housing, we need cheaper housing. I've said from the outset, I don't want people leaving Massachusetts. It's an awesome place. There's so much that's great about our state. But one thing that isn't great, and I'm being honest with the public about this, is our housing costs. We can do something about it, right? 
and we could do something about that. We've made it a priority. That's why we established a Secretary of Housing. We hadn't had that before, a Secretary of Housing and Livable Communities. And Secretary Augustus and his team have gotten after it. You saw the unprecedented investments we made in the budget. The tax cut, okay, the tax cut included significant tax incentives that will further supercharge development. And this bond bill, it's a big number, but that's because it's a big problem here in the state. It's also a solvable problem that will result in more housing, great jobs and career opportunities because of the amount of building construction that's going to be needed. And fundamentally, it's going to be so important and central to economic growth because we need employers and businesses to be able to stay here or locate here knowing that they have a workforce that can afford to live here. So I think these things are super, super important and um, will impact positively all residents of the state, but especially those, you know, um, uh, middle income. Uh, I certainly am aware of the situation, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. I know that our senators have already been in touch with the State Department. There's been a considerable amount of advocacy on their behalf, but it is a heartbreaking situation for them, for so many. Massachusetts is directly affected by so much of what is happening. You've covered uh, the number of families and people here who've been impacted by the events of the last couple of weeks. So our hearts go out to that family and to all families uh, who've been so, uh, so affected by all of this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. This is going to be great. I really appreciate it. Can't wait. Have your team hang here. We'll take a picture. Yeah, our communities are so pumped about this. I was with Gunstable earlier, and they were like, everyone's 